Proverbs 22, verse number 2. The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. The rich and the poor meet together. A lot of translations of this verse says the rich and the poor have something in common. They are both made by the Lord. I see it a little bit more than that though. The rich and the poor meet together. There is a community of man. There's a brotherhood of society. And usually where you have rich, you have poor. And vice versa. And I think even in the day and age in which we live, the division between the rich and the poor is greatly emphasized. And I think there's some thoughts we can find in the scripture. Our attitude toward the rich and toward the poor is very important. And it needs to be sanctified by the Spirit of God and by His Word. Poor folks sometimes hate rich folks. Or they're jealous of rich folks. Rich folks have been known to look down their noses at people with less than them. So, let's look at that. You know what's interesting? I was thinking, when I was thinking about this verse, and I was thinking about the rich and the poor and the, some of the, the, the things the Lord showed me. There have been many systems, political and social, throughout the history of man that wanted to make everyone equal. I don't know of one that succeeded. And we're going to find in the scripture you're always going to have the rich and the poor. I don't think true equality is going to come until eternity. When every child of God is a joint heir with Christ, everybody will be equal. But I want us to look at that because I, I think it's very important. I think it's a, a, a thing that we need to think about in our day and age in the society in which we live. The Lord is the maker of them all. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 2. 1 Samuel <coughs> chapter number 2 verses 7 and 8. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. One thing we need to remember about the rich and the poor, both are made so by the Lord. The Lord created both. The Lord created both. And although you have rich and you have poor, one thing they have in common, the Lord has made them both, but they have the same requirements of God. Look at Exodus chapter number 30. Exodus chapter number 30. <coughs> Verses 14 through 16. Exodus 30. 14 through 16. Everyone that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. Listen to this. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. I read all that to get this point. The rich and the poor paid alike for an atonement for their souls. Listen, being rich doesn't make you a saint. It also doesn't make you a reprobate. Being poor doesn't make you a saint. And it doesn't make you a reprobate. Both rich and poor have fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone in those two classes, and I dare say that's the whole world, 
We're going, to get, we're going to discuss that in a little more detail in a minute. But everyone in that needs the Lord. Every one of those rich and poor are fallen and lost outside of Christ. And listen, every rich person and every poor person who's been birthed into the kingdom, repented and been washed in the blood of Christ, are redeemed. Are redeemed. There's no difference. The only difference is money, position, or possessions, whatever value, earthly, monetary value. The rich and poor both have temptations that are specific to their circumstances. A rich man's temptations are not always the same as a poor's. And a poor man's temptations are different than a rich man's, but they are designed and come from their circumstances. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter number 30. Verses 8 and 9. Proverbs 30. Verses 8 and 9. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Now listen. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full. This sounds like rich people. And deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Both have temptations specific to their circumstances. Ecclesiastes, go over one more book. Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes 5. Verses 12 and 13. Ecclesiastes 5. Verses 12 and 13. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches. Now notice the next phrase. Kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. It does not say riches owned by people. Riches that are kept to their hurt. How do you handle your riches? How do, how do you handle possessions and blessings given to you of God? Do you hold on to them with white knuckles and greed and put them back and not use them for either the good of others or the glory of God? That's a sin. That's wrong. But it doesn't say riches are wrong. It said they're kept to the owner's hurt. Kept to the owner's hurt. 1 Timothy 6. And boy, 1 Timothy goes into a lot of this stuff. And especially about the rich. 1 Timothy 6. Ooh. Verses uh, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Right there is our whole lesson in a nutshell. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If a man has great wealth and he's content therein and he's using it for the glory of God, there's not a sin in that. If you're content where you are, even if you don't have what everyone else has and you are classified as poor, but you have your necessities, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. There's something rich and poor have in common. And having food and raiment, let us therewith, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and prediction, perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Greed, greed is a lose-lose situation. If God has provided, be content. And listen, there's lots of things you can say. What about the parable of the talents? God expected a prophet to come. 
work, use it. But you don't, but the rich, the riches should not be your God. The lack of riches should not be your God and a source of bitterness. Both have temptations specific to their circumstances. Return to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. Verses 30 and 31. Now, I always stay honest with the Word of God before you. The phrase here is talking about a thief, not necessarily a poor man, but we read a, a while ago, don't give me poverty where I would lift my hand to steal and take the name of the Lord in vain. So, here, so look at this man or this person who's stealing. Proverbs 6, 30 and 31. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. If he's hungry. Do you know what every rich man needs and every poor man needs? They need their basic necessities. A rich man can have a lot of extra kind of stuff. Most poor people don't, but they need their necessities. And that's where you get into being good stewards of what you have to make others' lives better and to be a good steward of what God has given you. Necessities. That brings me to another thought in consideration of this. How do you define rich and how do you define poor? It's a matter of comparison. It's a matter of relativity. It's a matter of degree. I dare say people who are in, on poverty level, they would think that the middle class people are rich. Most middle class people think millionaires and billionaires are rich. The Lord showed me to that on my job one time. I worked with a lot of young men who were younger than me. They made the same money I did, but they liked to party. They had children with various women, and they were always struggling. And when they found out that I was not married and didn't have any children, the word got out that I was wealthy, that I was rich. And I got to thinking about that, and you know what? Compared to them, I probably was. But before that could go to my head, I thought, Mr. Gates, Mr. Trump, and Miss Winfrey would laugh at my checkbook. Right? Do you see it's a matter of degree and a matter of comparison? Look at Matthew 19. Matthew 19. I think this is a very... Interesting statement by the disciples. This takes place after the rich young ruler comes and wants to know how to attain eternal life. And he leaves sorrowful because he had great possessions. And Jesus gets to talking about the rich and heaven. Matthew 19, 24 through 26. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Here's the thing that strikes me about this being recorded in the Word of God. I've always heard... Christ Jesus chose poor fishermen. I don't know that they were poor. I know they were working men. We don't read where they had hired to get the work done. But they said if a, a rich man passing through, a, a camel passing through the eye of a needle is how hard it is for a rich, who then can be saved? Because guess what? Those poor fishermen, if they were hard-working men, there were people in the world who considered them rich, and they were better off than people who had nothing. 
right? So they said, who then can be saved? Folks, we're all rich in a lot of ways. Blessings of God, talents and skills, peace, where you live, that sort of thing. Everyone is rich. And I've always heard it said in the world, and I don't know that I can argue with it, there's always somebody worse off than you. So guess what? If they're worse off to you, maybe you to them are a rich person. And you don't see yourself as rich. These poor fishermen said, who then can be saved? Thank God, Christ Jesus said it's possible with God. There's nothing impossible with Him. Christ Jesus is our example. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verse number 9. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 9. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was what? Rich. Yet for your sakes he became what? Poor. That ye through his what? Poverty. Might be what? Rich. You should use your blessings for the glory of God and for the good of others. Christ Jesus was rich. The crown prince of heaven and glory. He came down, locked himself inside a, bo a body, walked the earth, had to eat, had to sleep. He got tired, all that sort of thing. But why did he do that? To make poor folks like us rich in his grace and in his love and his salvation. That's our example. That's our example. When considering rich and poor, it seems the main issue is that uh, seems to be in the mind of man and what God's telling us in his word is a matter of respect. It's not a matter of dollars and cents and certain amounts and certain possessions and all that sort of stuff, certain belongings. It's a matter of respect. God is no respecter of persons. We're going to read that. So do you treat people differently? because of what they have? Do you treat people differently because of what they don't have? Look at James chapter number 2. Respect seems to be the issue with the haves and the have-nots. James 2, 1 through 10. We're very familiar with this, but I'm going to read through it quickly. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, here we go, there, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. That matters if your neighbor is poor or if your neighbor is rich. Ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convicted of the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Jeremiah chapter number 9. Jeremiah Chapter number 9, verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah, chapter number 9, 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, 
Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. You know what these two verses tell me? A rich man can glorify the Lord. A poor man can glorify the Lord. What you have, what you possess, your life does not consist in that abundance. Jesus said that. A man's life to, uh, consists not in the abundance of the things he possesses. Your life consists in your relationship with God. And it says here, a rich man and a wise man. There's a place in the New Testament that says not many wise are chosen, but wise can be chosen. They can glory in the Lord. They can glory in the knowledge of the Lord, that the Lord has made them, that He requires the same, same thing of you as He requires of others whose lots and stations in life are different than you. Look at Leviticus 19. The book of Leviticus 19. Verses 14 and 15. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear thy God. I am the Lord. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Folks, if a man is accused of a crime and there is a sufficient evidence to prove his guilt, it shouldn't matter if he's rich or if he's poor. The judgment should be made. He should be treated the same. And we don't see that a lot in our society. Well, yes, he did that, but you know he was poor. He never had anything, da-da-da-da-da. The Lord instructed us in his word. When you pass judgments, you don't have respect of persons. You need to consider the facts of the case. Not the financial situation of the perpetrator or the accused. Or the accused. The poor do not have a separate judgment. Neither do the rich. Neither do the rich. Look at Psalm 41. Psalm 41. But our treatment of one another and of, and of the poor and of the rich and especially of the poor is of utmost importance. Psalm 41, 1 through 3. Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he shall be blessed upon the earth. And thou shalt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his, his, thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. That sounds kind of strange to me, but the turning, the Kalmar reference says, that will make, that will turn his bed in his sickness. God will bless you if you have consideration of the poor. If you have consideration of the poor. Look at Luke 4. Luke 4. Verses 17 and 19. This is when Jesus is in the synagogue and he reads out of the book of Isaiah. Luke 4, 17 through 19. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place wherein it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to whom? He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. All right, having read this, and Jesus, when he read it, he said, this, word's, uh, this word is fulfilled this day in himself. I want to ask you a question. Are the financially destitute the only ones 
who are to receive the gospel. When he says the poor have the gospel preached to them, is he only talking about those who are destitute financially? I say no. Because there is another state of being poor that has nothing to do with possessions. And y'all know where I'm going, so let's go there. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. And verse number 3. Matthew 5, verse number 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not in wealth, not in money, not in position, not in social standing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A rich man who's got everything he wants financially and in possessions, and he's outside of God, he's poor in spirit. When you're dead in trespasses and sin and lost and outside of a good relationship with the Lord, you're poor in spirit. Folks, the rich and the poor have a lot in common. They need the Lord. It doesn't matter what your standing is and how, what your ledger says and what your checkbook says. It's what your spirit says. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I want to get back to the thought that when you're dealing with the poor, and boy, we have a lot of wrestling with this. I've heard it talked about it around the table at church and stuff and people in conversations. We have people standing on the side of the road. We have people who beg. And a lot of us get frustrated. And a lot of us don't want to help anyone with his or her addiction. But what about, and, then, and we know there are people, we see them interviewed on the news. Their career is begging. They don't want to work, they can beg and make more money. But there are people who cannot work. Lazarus, who sat at the rich man's gate, was full of sores. He could not work, and he was a beggar. So what do you do about all that? I think it gets back to the point of necessity. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're naked, clothe them. If they need shelter, provide that some way. Take them in or provide a, a place. It's the necessities that determines the poorness. And if they're unable to work, they need help. And let me tell you something. I, this thought just came to me. Thank you, Lord. I wasn't able to work for my salvation. I didn't have the ability. I couldn't work to get God's attention and for Him to save me. And, I, and guess what? Salvation's an absolute necessity. Christ Jesus provided it. The Lord provided it. I want to show you something else. John 12. Oh, I need to hurry. John 12. In verse number 8, I alluded to this in the beginning. Until the church is with Christ in eternity and all those who are separated from God are separated forever, there are going to be poor and rich. Look at John 12, verse number 8. Remember, the lady uh, did the, washed his feet with her tears, broke open that alabaster box, and Judas made a comment about it. It could have gone to the poor. And although we read where he wasn't really all that interested in the poor, he was a thief. But Jesus, you know, didn't, didn't address his heart. Jesus addressed the fact that there are poor people. Verse number 8. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Look at Deuteronomy 15. Deuteronomy 15. Verses 7 through 11. 
But if there be among you a poor man of, of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thy hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. And wanteth is not desire that slacketh. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him nothing, and the cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be a sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thy hand to. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thy hands wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. Folks, until eternity comes, Christ Jesus returns, there's always going to be poor. You know what that tells me? There's always going to be rich. And how we treat them and what we do concerning their necessities is our opportunity to be a good witness, to be a good soldier of the Lord, and to reflect the generosity, the grace, and the mercy of God that He bestowed upon us who were poor in spirit. We can do that to those who are without necessity. Remember the church at Laodicea? We're fine. We don't need anything. We're increased with goods. And God told him, you're wretched, poor, blind, and naked. But repent, repent, and I'll forgive you. Let's conclude with Isaiah 55. This is a familiar portion of Scripture. But I see it in a new light now, having looked at the rich and the poor. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, all you got to do is be thirsty. Come you to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Drop down to 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The rich and the poor, our attitude toward them is of utmost importance.